Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to some of you joining us from far away. Um, we're going to wait a minute or so to allow more of our parents and guardians to join our session before we really get underway. So pretend like we have some beautiful elevator music going on right now. I'll dismiss my appointments, um, but we're really excited. We, we see you all shuffling in and there's it looks like over 300 are here. We have over a thousand uh, parents and guardians are registered for our session this morning. Um, we certainly appreciate you all sharing a bit of your Sunday with us. My name is Armin Sarkissian. I serve as the Director of First Year Admission at Chapman University. Uh, some of you might know us very well, have been to our campus several times, might even have a child that's currently enrolled or has recently graduated from the university. I'm sure some of you don't really know Chapman too well. So we are, we're going to bring a little bit of everything to you today. Um, we are certainly going to have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. That's really going to be one of our main focuses. We do have the Q&A uh, feature enabled, and I have several colleagues that are in that space. So if you have questions as we're going and you, you want to type into that Q&A, you can. Um, we will be recording this session and sharing it out in the coming days on our recorded session page, and you'll receive an email that will direct you to that page in case you want to check it out and, and kind of circle back on anything. Um, I'm also joined by one of my colleagues, uh, the Director of Engagement and Volunteerism is going to be joining us um, to speak a little bit about our parents and, and how you all can be engaged with your students once they are here on our campus. Um, for starters, we're, we're going to definitely talk a little bit about Chapman from a, an overview standpoint. We will dive into the admission process and journey and how you all can support your students through it, what we look for, how we make decisions, talk about our timelines. Um, we're also going to discuss financial aid and then round out with some housing and campus life info and certainly some parent opportunities. Um, so for starters, you know, for those that don't know Chapman too well, we are a mid-sized comprehensive university that's located in the heart of Orange County, California. Um, Orange is, is a really cool college town, but we are in a very dynamic part of the country. A lot of people don't realize how amazing Orange County is in of itself. Orange County is the sixth largest county in the United States, and there's over 85,000 businesses that are across all industries. But when, our, when your students are on our campus, they're not going to feel like they're in this massive concrete jungle. Um, the mid-size component to us matches really well with the comprehensive nature. You know, we have nearly 8,000 undergrads. And as we've grown over the years, um, we have become the third largest private university in the state of California from an undergraduate enrollment standpoint, which is really neat. But we're also small where it matters most, and that's in the classroom. Um, you know, your, your students are going to know their faculty and their faculty are going to know your students. It, developing these really strong mentorships. Um, some of your students will be inviting their faculty to their weddings later on down in life. You know, it's, it's something that's really important to our community to have that engaged one-on-one um, -on -one personalized experience. But because we're mid-sized, you also are going to be in a very diverse setting. You know, students are coming from over 60 countries around the world. You'll see that 45% of our students are students that identify as a person of color. When you join our campus, it is a microcosm of the world. And not only are you developing this really cool global network and learning from students that are coming from all around the world, but you're you're also having this sense of familiarity. You know, you'll cross our campus and within a month, you're going to feel at home. So that, that mid-size is really unique and special. The comprehensive nature, we have over 120 areas of study. So if your student knows exactly what they want to do, that's awesome. They can dive in right away. But some might want to explore a little bit. In, in college, that's you know what, what you should be seeking is the opportunity to learn a little more about something that isn't in your direct area. So having those 120 programs, for the most part, they're really easy to navigate between. Um, and it's, it's important for our students to, to have that freedom. The areas that get a little tricky with that are talent areas, anything in our Dodge College of Film and Media Arts, anything in our College of Performing Arts, so theater, dance, music, that type of stuff. It can be very difficult to get into those programs once you're at Chapman. We can certainly talk about that if you have questions, but for the most part, you know, it, it's pretty open and easy to transition in and out of. Um, and from a, an undecided student standpoint, there's about 20% of our students come in undecided and decide what they want to do while they're there. So again, that comprehensive nature gives your students a lot of freedom to figure it out if they don't have it quite figured out yet. 
Um, to talk a little bit about the admission timeline, I think it's really important to understand what you'll see and, and the timeline that's involved here. Um, obviously, the August 1st piece is come and gone. You know, Common App opened on August 1st, and we had our first submission that same day. Um, we actually have experienced a record in this early action, early decision space, which is really exciting. Um, that deadline was November 1st, so just five days ago. Um, that those students you'll see in a minute um, are going to hear from us in mid-December, depending on their timeline. Uh, we do have a regular decision deadline of January 15th. So if you haven't, if, if your student hasn't submitted an application yet and they're still really interested and in, in still crafting things, there's obviously quite a bit of time leading up to that January 15th deadline. Um, and then we do recognize May 1st as that intent to enroll deadline where students do need to let us know what their plans are. To dive into the nuance of our notification timelines, I think it's, it's really important. Um, first and foremost, if you are an early decision student, you will hear from us regardless of what program you apply to in mid to late December. And that's not just your admission um, notification. It would include potentially merit scholarship if you receive it, as well as your full financial aid package. So those early decision students get everything really early on. Early action students will hear right around that same timeline as far as admission and any potential scholarship. Uh, the financial aid component will come a little bit later, most likely in late January, maybe early February. Our students are applying to our uh, call to performing art programs. Um, they can actually start hearing as early as late November going through to mid-March, and that involves you know, students are potentially called back to do an in-person audition or not. Um, the film and television production students, this is a really popular area. You know, Chapman gets a lot of notoriety for our film program, deservedly so. But these students have a little bit of a lengthier timeline, regardless of early action or not. Um, you'll hear from us in early February, most likely. The only students to that program I'll hear earlier are students that apply early decision. They will hear from us in December. And then finally, the regular decision candidates, you'll hear from us in mid-March. So what do we do? What do we look for? What's important to Chapman in our admission office? Um, and really, it's everything. And I know that that can be cliche and, and kind of confusing. And what we really try to do is bring a lot of transparency into this process. We want you all to understand that the holistic nature of our review intends on cultivating a campus community of people that aren't just excellent students that are prepared to do well, but excellent people that are going to contribute and enrich our community. So we are really doing a deep dive into every application. We're first and foremost looking at everything from a context standpoint. What does that mean? Well, it means that we want to understand the background, the lived experiences, the academic opportunities, the types of engagement that your student might have in their own community. These are really important to us. So we really dive in, you know, what type of curriculum is offered at their high school? And are they challenging themselves? Or are they taking that easy path? We really want to understand you know, that rigor component and are they ready to handle the rigor that they'll face here? Certainly there's a lot of support for our students, but we need to make sure that they're ready to step in and handle what they'll see. Um, the area of study is really big when we come to our review process. If a student's applying to any of our STEM programs or anything within the School of Business and Economics, we really wanna make sure that that quantitative ability is there. Uh, we look deep into your community impact, and some students are going to have this come through in a lot of different ways. You know, there's really traditional ways in which students get involved in extracurricular activities, whether it's sports or performing arts, and if you're a captain or lead role or first chair, those are really traditional elements, and we, we certainly look for students that demonstrate depth, breadth, and persistence in those areas. To us, really, the biggest pieces are the depth and persistence. You know, are you are you really engaged in being a leader? Um, not that you have to be a leader in every face, but or in every facet. But we really do want to see students engaged and, and see what they're going to bring to our table. There are really a lot of ways in which students are going to impact their community in non traditional ways too. Uh, we have a really large amount of first generation college going students or students coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And those students often have to be working part time to help pay for bills or save for college. Um, and that is really significant. Some of our students are coming from single parent family homes and they need to help take care of younger siblings um, to a degree that is basically they're a second parent. 
we really pay a lot of attention to that impact, whether it's in their most direct community, that of their family and household, or in their school setting, or in their region or state or nation or even world. So we really want to see what students are doing. And, and lastly, we look at this, this component, and you'll hear a lot of this from, from your college search process, like that fit component. And what does that mean? Well, when we went into a test optional realm, which was uh, right before the pandemic, this was after a three-year study that was conducted by our Economic Science Institute. Our ESI is actually led by a Nobel laureate on campus, um, Dr. Vernon Smith. And, and we certainly trust the outcomes of that study in showing that test scores are not um, indicative of student success on our campus. So we went into this test optional realm. And when we did that, we, we really had to pull the layers back and say, well, what else does matter and what can we hone in on more? And this kind of comes into that Chapman fit component. And really there are certain characteristics and attributes that we're really seeking to suss out throughout the application, whether it's the essays or rec letters, short answers. These are things that are really important. And it's kind of funny. We, we actually came up with this acronym and it, it just naturally happened, but it's, it's ironically cheesy. And that acronym is SAPI. We are looking for SAPI in our students. We're looking for students that are self-advocates, those that are going to really be out there and, and, and put themselves in the driver's seat of their education and of their life. So that self-advocacy is really important. We're looking for students that are authentic. We want you to be yourself and bring your voice to our table. We're looking for students that demonstrate potential, you know, and it's not just academic potential, it's personal potential and have that growth mindset. We really want students to be hungry and, and that potential is going to really be their foundation that they're going to launch from on our campus. We look for students that demonstrate the ability to persevere. All of us are gonna experience different levels of adversity and, and it's really important to know that in college life, can be difficult and challenging, not just your academics, but everything going on around it. So are you able to persevere through difficult times? Um, and lastly, we look for empathy. We want students to be kind. We want them to be respectful. We want them to be gracious. We want them to be part of the community and care about it from an altruistic standpoint. So that SAPI is core to our review process. This is where students might be a little bit below our academic averages, but if they're really dripping and sappy in our review and it's really shining, it's something that we get really excited about. Now, hopefully you all have decided, you know, you're applying to Chapman and you're going to figure this next page out, this, this piece of this cost component. This is a really critical piece to your college search and journey and making sure that, you know, it's not just a personal fit and an academic fit, but a financial fit is really key, key here too. Uh, we're, we're private. We're Orange County, Southern California. We get it. You know, that right there should sound those five alarm bells of like, this is probably going to be an expensive place. Um, first and foremost, that total cost of attendance that you see here of north of $82,000. Yes, that, that is a lot of money um, to 99.9% .9 of us in this world. And, and we do recognize that that is, is a high cost. I'll start by saying, I feel very firmly that we deliver to that value. We are, you know, world-class faculty, world-class facilities, unique opportunities in, in one of the most dynamic parts of the country with Orange County. You know, we have strategic partnerships that allow students to really have a comfortable next step once they reach graduation. So I do feel firmly that that $82,000 is, is something that you'll see that value in, but we're going to help support students through that cost. And, and there's a variety of things that come into play when it comes to financial aid. So first and foremost, you'll see that we are going to review all students for merit-based scholarship. Regardless of your personal financial aid background, you will see that every single student, all you have to do is apply for admission. If you do apply for admission, you will receive that consideration for merit-based scholarship. That ranges up to $36,000 right away. So nothing extra you need to do, no extra deadlines, no extra documents or essays. Just apply for admission, you'll do that. The only other thing that you need to do to be considered for everything else that you see here is submit a FAFSA for our students that are US citizens, or passport holders, or green card holders. You will submit a FAFSA. 
that FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid is now open and available. Um, you do have, you know, an early March deadline to have that submitted. But if you submit an application and a FAFSA, we'll consider you for merit-based scholarship, departmental funding, need-based aid, mission-driven awards. There's a lot of different things that can kind of come into play here. Departmental scholarships typically reside in our talent areas. So you'll see that it's, you know, dance, theater, music, film. But we also have a lot of funding in our School of Engineering, some of our other sciences as well. So you, you never know what you'll be qualifying for. Again, nothing extra that your student needs to do. Just submit an application, submit a FAFSA. We'll consider them for everything. The need-based aid side of things can come in the form of Chapman Grant, Cal Grant for California residents and citizens, federal Pell Grant. Uh, there's self-help that will come into play. And all of this stuff might help make Chapman affordable for you and your family. We see students that receive um, more funding and we become more affordable than public in-state options for themselves um, through the various need-based awards or awards that we do have to offer here. You'll see that this past year, we over awarded over $175 million of financial aid to our students. There was over $2 million of mission-driven awards that are focused on um, you know, first generation students for the most part, 18% of our students are Pell Grant recipients and 84% of our students receive some sort of financial aid or scholarship. So you'll see that there's a lot of funding that's out there. And again, all you need to do is apply for admission and submit a FAFSA. We'll take care of the rest and we'll stay in contact with you. Just as there's admission officers that you have access to, we have phenomenal financial aid people that are here and ready to help you once we get to that point. So, the role that you as a parent can have or guardian in this process is, is critical to know. We want to have conversations with you. We welcome your voice in this space, but it can't be just your voice. It really needs to be led by your student. And I think it's easy to relate this to helping your student learn how to drive and, and, and to kind of analogize it to that. A lot of you probably done that recently. I'm, I'm several years away. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and I'm terrified for that moment when it comes. But I'm sure that some of you have had a lot of anxiety with this, and, and, and it's okay to have that, but you really need to find a way to put them in the driver's seat for this process. You want to support and assist, but you can't do it for them. You can't drive for them. You can't go to college for them. You can't submit your, their applications. You need to really encourage them to step into this space. And remind them that most students are nervous in this space, and most students do have anxiety, and it's very natural. Um, it's okay. We're used to that. We're, everybody on our staff and in our team and, and really at the university at large is really excited to help students, but we really want them to lean into this themselves. And it goes back to that self-advocacy piece that we we're talking about at the beginning. What you want to do is make sure that your student's checking in with us in admission, um, you know, make sure that they're reaching out and really that they're organized in this process. You know, it's, it's important for them to log into their status page. It's okay if they share that login information with you, um, but we're going to communicate quite a bit of great info to students through that application status page. They receive this in a, in a confirmation email um, within 24 to 48 hours after submitting their Common App. So they'll see that um, they'll want to come in, log in, set up their new password. They'll see a checklist of all the different documents that we have either received or that are still outstanding. Um, if a student's applying to our talent programs that require creative supplement, they'll be able to submit that creative supplement on their application status page. And you'll also see that we're going to communicate admission decisions, scholarship decisions, and even post financial aid uh, awards that are on this app status page. So this becomes a really, really big piece for you all to be very organized with and through. Um, lastly, before we we kind of change you know gears here, uh, is just some information related to on-campus housing. Our housing opportunities at Chapman are awesome. Um, you know, if you can live on campus, it, it truly is a, a once in a lifetime type of experience. We do have a two year housing requirement and guarantee for our students. Um, first year students will live in really traditional residence halls. Um, they are suite style. So they'll either have their own bathroom or share with the room right next to them. It's not any communal bathrooms down the hall or anything like that. And we do all of our live, uh, all of our living spaces on a live learn community basis. So your students will be living with and amongst other students that are either in their same major or in the same school or college or academic areas of interest. We do have housing for transfer students. Um, most of the time it's not required, but it is available and students 
are able to apply for housing after those first two years. We do have um, a lot of apartments both on and off campus that are university owned that uh, will allow a student to have that space. You will see a lot of students that move off campus after their sophomore year though. And it's whether it's in the local area that's surrounding us as we're residentially set, or maybe they're moving a little bit further away um, with friends. So it, it really is just one of those things that, you know, we have great housing opportunities and, and you'll see that you're well taken care of here. Um, you know, the last thing that I want to kind of, you know, underscore one more time is just responding to admission offers. This is really important, especially for selective institutions. You don't want to miss these deadlines. If you are an early decision admitted student, you do need to submit your um, enrollment deposit by January 10th. And then if you are early action or regular decision, you have until May 1st. It's really important to not miss that deadline. Our month of April is just chocked full of students that are really excited to potentially come here and, and they're asking a lot of great questions and we welcome that. A lot of it's about financial aid and trying to see if they can receive better awards. It's really important to start those conversations early with us, not wait until April 29th and saying, hey, we just submitted a an appeal with FAFSA to, to see if we can have more financial aid. The students that wait till that very last bit, it can be very stressful and very difficult to get through in time for that May 1 deadline. And then we do have a June 1st deadline for our transfer students that are applying to the fall. So with that said, I would well, like to welcome my colleague, Nicole Bigley, um, to this space. Nicole, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you, Armin. Um, the Office of Parent Engagement is going to be the primary contact for any Chapman parent. We are here to answer questions or concerns through a parent phone number an email, and we also have a parent Facebook page. So we are here to help you encourage your student to utilize the campus resources so that they have the most positive Chapman experience possible. And we're also here to help you foster your own connection to the university um, through a lot of areas that might interest you. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, we, our department has three different goals. And so our first is connecting parents to campus. Second is to resources on campus. And third is to each other. So we connect parents to campus in a few different events. Uh, the first is the new student orientation, where we not only welcome students, but provide parents with um, a great first look at campus and provide resources in that weekend. Um, the Chapman Family Homecoming brings parents, students, and alumni all together for a weekend in the fall semester. And the Parent Spring Summit is our signature event in the spring that welcomes parents specifically for a weekend of programming to explore the Orange Campus, learn about resources, and connect with other parents. And we also offer a variety of volunteer opportunities um, for anyone who's visiting in the area. We connect parents to resources on campus through town halls, which are informational sessions, very similar to this one, um, but are done with different departments across campus. We also create parent resource packets that are tailored to provide you resources that align with your students' experience each year. So it specifically goes into, you know, as a parent of freshman student, what, what, what does that look like? How can I support my student all the way through? Uh, we also have monthly e-newsletters and the parent Facebook page, which I mentioned earlier. And lastly, we connect parents to each other in a few different ways. The first being regional receptions um, in areas around the country that have high concentrations of parents and alumni. The next is parent meetups, which are more informal gatherings of parents um, and also in regions across the country. And then Chapman Chats are a way for parents to gather virtually. Um, so those uh, are different ways that the Office of Parent Engagement is here to support all of our parents. Go ahead, Armin. Trying to get unmuted. That always happens. <laughs> um, and get my video back on. How do I do that? Well, you all can hear my voice. Um, there we go. Start video. Easy. Um, this is just a quick slide of our team. Um, you, you don't necessarily need to contact me or Marcella. You have access to admission officers that are assigned to your territory. We, we like to take this territory approach because it allows us to really understand the communities in which our students are coming from. I cover Colorado, Wyoming, and the island of Oahu out in Hawaii. Um, but each one of you, your student is assigned to one of these counselors, and you can find their information pretty easily. Um, if you want, you can take a, a screenshot of this 
or you can look at the bottom right QR code of Meet Your Counselor. That's where students can put in or, or parents can put in uh, the high school that your student goes to, and you'll find the counselor that is assigned to that area very quickly. Um, you're welcome to just introduce yourself. You're welcome to have your student just answer, ask questions. If you all want to engage with us in other spaces, in any of the social spaces, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, you, you certainly can do that as well. We have um, really fun things that we're going to do there. And we, we encourage you to lean in on it. Um, and, and now we really want to dive into the Q&A. So I'm going to stop with my screen share and kind of get back into um, really understanding what else we can help with. And there's a lot of questions that have been kind of coming and going. So that's, that's super exciting to us. Um, I, I've seen a lot of questions about, you know, my child's applying early action when I'm going to hear. We, we answered some of that stuff. Um, it's hard for me as the presenter to also be fielding questions and, and talking, but um, there, there's some questions about, you know, work study and, and what does that look like? Financial aid, this is a really big piece of helping students um, handle that. And for us, when it's coming to work study, that is a component of a need-based aid award that is uh, federally backed. So, when you submit a FAFSA, you are going to be reviewed for that. And if the federal government comes back and says that you're eligible for that financial aid award, then that'll be part of your financial aid package. Typically, a really standard work study award is about $3,000. Um, you aren't given a job. You have to apply for jobs. Your, your student will have to apply for jobs. And, and if you do receive that award, we really encourage students to start looking during the summer um, and early on in that fall because that allows you to work down that portion of your, your tuition um, tax-free, which is really, really nice. Um, there's a question about how easy it is to walk on to a sports team at Chapman. If any of you are student athletes, I really encourage you to um, step into this space and contact the coaches right away. Um, if you haven't been in touch with them yet, that's okay, but they'll certainly let you know exactly what you can expect from a walk-on status. Um, a lot of our coaches do recruit, and, and if you're not on their you know list early on, it can be difficult to join teams, specifically our men's baseball team. Um, you know, they're, they're usually identifying their, their recruits during the, their junior year, but many other programs do allow a lot of walk-ons. There's a lot of student athlete opportunities. We have 21 varsity sports, um, several club sports, a lot of intramural opportunities. So if you, if you want to play a sport, talk to the coaches, see what that entails. Um, they will also let us know who they're recruiting in our office. So that also helps. Diving in, and, and Nicole, if you're reading any questions that really pop up to you, feel free to to throw those my way. Um, yeah, there's one about um, submitting a FAFSA if you're only applying for merit aid. Yeah, students aren't required to submit a FAFSA, um, but we we do welcome that, and and I encourage it because some students might say, you know, we're not going to qualify for need based aid. And, and that might be true if it's at your local public and state option, but with our cost of attendance, you know, financial aid is a component of cost of attendance in the student's EFC. EFC is that estimated family contribution. Um, and, you know, with our cost of attendance being above $80,000 a year, you know, you'd have to have a pretty high EFC to not be able to uh, qualify for need-based aid. So we still encourage you to do it, but we will review, assess, and award merit scholarships regardless of a FAFSA being submitted. We're making both admission and scholarship decisions prior to seeing if a student even submitted a FAFSA. So you don't need to have that submitted in order to be reviewed for it. Um, and another one is after applying, does Chapman assess first and second semester senior year grades to determine GPA or class rigor? That's a good question. Um, we we will make admission and scholarship decisions on early action and early decision students uh, most of the time without having any senior year grades on file. Um, and that's for the EAED. Regular decision students, we typically have at least like the first term, whether it's first trimester, first quarter, first semester, we will usually have those grades on file. Um, for the EAED students, we might roll their application into our regular pool. And sometimes we do that because we want to see how senior year is going. You might be applying to engineering and we want to see how you're doing in you know, AP calculus. Um, those are things that are really important to us. So do well 
You know, it's not like, hey, I submitted my application, I'm good to go. You need to do well. You, your students do need to, to stay with it senior year, and especially that final semester. Um, eighth semester review, we have a process in the summer where we review every single deposited student's transcript for any you know, types of hiccups and, and making sure, you know, we're not just like looking to revoke admission on students, but we might, because if a student doesn't do well in that final closeout, you know, we might be pulling that. So senior year is important. It just depends on what you apply for, if it's going to count in our admission review. Next one is, uh, what are some reasons why a student may not, may not be a good fit for Chapman? Oh, um, I, I appreciate that question. I think that we are a dynamic enough institution where I think that we can kind of be a good fit for most students that are, are looking to go to college in general. It doesn't mean that we're the perfect fit. Um, you know, if you are really into like the big D1 raw raw atmosphere um you know college football saturdays and like the types of stuff that you see on espn and game day and you know university of alabama if you if you want that huge sports d1 type of experience then obviously we we aren't going to have that um but we do have great Chapman spirit and Panther pride. You know, we, we have great attendance to our football games and basketball games and lacrosse games and our athletic programs are very competitive. It's just not that massive D one type of experience. Um, the other piece is like, I, I think that students that do well on our campus have those, those five characteristics I, I was mentioning earlier. If those don't resonate with you, then maybe Chapman's not a good place for you as well. Um, can you, I think you already touched on this, but if you can repeat the average cost of attendance for students after aid. Yeah, so, you know, average cost, I I, I get why students and families want to know that, but every single student's going to have their own unique experience when it comes to where they land, whether it's merit scholarship or need-based aid. Our average package of gift aid last year was a little over $31,000. Um, so, you know, you're talking your, your cost is in that, in that 50,000, but we have students that receive zero funding and we have students that receive over $50,000 of gift aid. Um, and again, it's really important to just know that you just need to do your part, apply for admission, submit a FAFSA, we'll do the rest. Would the acceptance notification come through an email to the parents as well, or just through the student portal? Great question. It's only through the portal. Um, we email to students saying, hey, there's an update to your application status page, go check it out. We do not email the actual decision itself. The only place that we post it is in the student's portal. Can you talk about the social life at Chapman? What are students doing on weekends and nights? You know, I, I encourage your students and for you to reach out to our current students to learn more about that uh, because every student's going to have a different take. Every student's going to have a different approach to what they do. We do have a very, a very vibrant social life on campus, whether it's through clubs and organizations, Greek organizations, or just being where we are. Um, first, we have almost 200 clubs and organizations that students are involved in. We have nine fraternities and nine sororities and a little over 30%, it's like 35% usually are involved in Greek life on our campus. Chapman's Greek life is very different than what you'll see stereotypically and what you think of when you think of Greek life. Um, it's much more inclusive as opposed to exclusive. You'll see that our students are you know, engaging in philanthropy, leadership, networking, are there social aspects for sure? There, there's, there's parties and date dashes and exchanges and formals and all the fun stuff that comes with it. It's just a much healthier vibe than what you'd see at most of those kind of big schools. We do not have a Greek row, which is a big piece of this. Um, so there's not, you know, over a hundred students in one organization living in one big house together. Um, it pushes a lot of programming back onto campus. We have uh, Greek week competitions, we have skit night, there's a lot of things. And you'll see students that are friends with uh, people that are in other organizations, you'll have non Greek students involved in Greek um, events and going to them. So there's a lot of different things that'll come into play when it comes to that Greek side, but over 60% of our students are not Greek. So there's a lot that's going on. When I was at Chapman, I graduated in 2006. And I'm originally from Colorado myself. Um, when I was there, we, we were a much smaller campus. We were 3,200 undergrads, and a lot of our students were from Southern California. Now we have nearly 70% of our, our students coming from over 100 miles away. So it, it 
it really brings in a lot of life and a lot of students are going off campus on the weekends together, whether it's a ski trip or a camping trip or going down to the beach. Uh, you know, we're, we're 20 minutes to Newport beach. We're 10 minutes at Disneyland. Like there's a lot going on. Um, your students will be very busy, very quickly on our campus. And the week leading up to the first term, um, our orientation week will get you assimilated very fast. So lots, lots happening, but again, every student's going to have a little bit of a different social experience and what they really lean into and what they're into. Um, can you talk specifically about the film production program for how many applicants you received for fall 2023 and about yeah. how many spots would be available? Uh, it's a great question. And, and there's a lot of interest in that. And I appreciate students um, trying to figure out you know, what, what their odds are. We receive a little over a thousand applications to the film and television production program every year. And we typically admit around 90 students to that program. So single digit um, admission rates are, are very standard within that program. And, you know, it, 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 I think it speaks to the quality of the program for sure. Um, and, you know, the students are applying and getting into that program. They're applying to and getting into some of the best film schools in the country. I mean, we're, we're ranked number four in the nation which basically means we're number four in the world when it comes to film and television production. So very, very selective program. Um, dance, theater performance, and screen acting can also be viewed in that same light. Not necessarily single digits, um, but in the teens typically um, for those other programs. Can you talk about uh, financial aid for international applicants? Yeah. Um, so all, all of our students, whether you're domestic or international, will be automatically considered for a merit scholarship. Um, that's not the case at all institutions. Some universities don't have merit scholarship available to international students. So that's one piece of it. We also require and ask for our international students to submit um, what's, what we call our international supplement form. And it's um, funding information, bank documents, and, and how much funding the family has for their, their student to be here um, because we we don't meet full need. And part of receiving your I-20 and your visa issuance process requires to, to demonstrate that ability to be here from a funding standpoint. So there's not a right or wrong numbers. International students need to submit that form with the accurate number, what, what they are able to afford and, and spend. And then they have to show bank documents to back it up. Um, if there's a small gap, we do have a small pot of international um, need-based aid that we could potentially award. So if you have $50,000 on that form and we issue you a $30,000 scholarship, we have a little gap. And if you're one of our top students that we're really into, um, we might bridge that final gap with this, this need-based aid award. Again, nothing extra that you need to do. You just apply for admission. We'll consider you for everything that we have. Can you go into a little detail about study abroad opportunities? Yeah, you know, the pandemic obviously changed things for a short period of time, but we're starting to come back to life when it comes to our study abroad. And we're really excited about that because pre-pandemic you had um, all, just under 60% of our students had an abroad experience. So we're, we're not quite back there yet, but we are we're moving quickly towards it. Chapman will support and encourage abroad opportunities in a lot of ways. First, we incentivize it. We actually have it baked into our general education, which is unique and it's exciting. If a student decides to study abroad for a full semester while they're at Chapman, you can have six credits. So two classes completely waived from your general education requirements. That is a way for us to say, go abroad, experience life, bring it back to our campus. You know, That's something that we want to see. We go to over 40 countries around the world every year. We have multiple countries that will have multiple opportunities within it. Um, we have eight different internships that are aligned up for students if they're interested in not just studying abroad, but also doing an internship while they're abroad. We do the Semester at Sea program. Really fun fact here, Chapman was the founding institution for Semester at Sea. So hopping on that cruise ship and studying while you're at sea and stopping at like eight or nine port cities as you go. Um, we do travel courses too. And those will typically take place during interterm or during the summer. Travel courses are exclusively led by Chapman faculty and are exclusively for Chapman students. 
Um, so the, there's a lot of ways in which we'll do abroad opportunities. Some of those travel courses are domestic travel courses. Like we have a, a business course that's called a walk on wall street, where you go to New York for a couple of weeks with finance professors and the Dean of the business school and, um, do a lot of stuff. We have one that goes to the Galapagos. Um, there, there's just a lot of really cool opportunities for students that are interested in that study abroad component. I will say from a soapbox standpoint, it's my one regret. I never studied abroad while I was in college and I wish I could turn back those tables and, and change that up, um, especially with how well Chapman does it and how easy we make it. What percentage of undergrads are from the LA or Orange County area? Yeah, so right now I would say we're a little bit it's, it's probably just under like 25% are from kind of Southern California broadly. Um, it might be more like 25 to 30% are from that area. We become more and more diverse from a, a locale standpoint every year. Um, and that's just because we're getting a lot of great applicants are coming from everywhere. And it's, it's intentional for us to continue to grow from a diversity standpoint and a geographic plays into that. Um, so you'll see that there are a fair number of students are from Orange County in Southern California at large. Uh, but again, we, we have a lot of students, nearly half of our students are coming from out of state. Um, and then there's, you know, about 20 to 25% of our students are coming from Northern California. For those that are California residents, you can definitely attest to Northern California and Southern California are very different. They're very far from each other. The weather's different. The, the people, the culture, the lifestyle, everything's very different. So um, while half of our students are in state, about half of those are, in my eyes, kind of almost out of state because they're from Northern California. Yeah, I grew up in the Bay Area and went to Chapman. It's very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, um, so can you talk a little bit about campus security? Um, specifically, like, can anyone walk onto campus? Maybe a little bit about public safety? Yeah. So, you know, I, I have two young daughters and I really appreciate this question a lot more than I, I did before having them is like, what, what does safety look like? What does it mean? And how does Chapman make sure that things are kept safe? First of all, we are an open campus and I, that is a testament to how safe the area is. So we don't have gates that surround campus and you know, you'll see that there are a lot of community members that walk through our space and whether it's taking their dog for a walk or a young family with their newborn strolling through, you know, you'll see that often. Um, but we are, are residentially set in a really safe area. We have both our Orange Police Department and Orange Fire Department are within two miles of campus. We have your standard blue light system um, where you know, you'll have that every 100 yards or so, where if you feel unsafe, you can hit that and it'll go to public safety, police department, fire department. Um, you'll see that we promote students to have healthy behavior and safe behavior. Uh, we have ride share opportunities, or you can call public safety. If like you're over in our dance facilities or film facilities and it's late at night, you can call public safety and ask for them to drive you back to your dorm so you don't have to make that walk by yourself. Um, Chapman in general is just a very, very safe place. You'll see that there's Panther alerts too. So as parents, you can sign up for these and we will email you, text you and call you with any really big issue that's, that's happening on campus. And we'll keep you kind of updated. Um, I'm subscribed to them as a staff member. I'm sure you are too, Nicole. And yeah. it almost is like too often that you get stuff <laughs> that you're like, that's not a big deal, but thanks for letting me know. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a very, very safe area. Um, yeah, because they'll even let us know if um, like there's a power out locally or, you know, yeah. things like that, aside from um, just general safety in the area. Yep. You um, need to maintain a certain GPA to keep continue your uh, merit based financial aid. Yes, all students have to have a 2.75 or higher to maintain their, their scholarship if they receive one. How easy is it for a student to get academic support or career counseling? You know, this is going to go back to that self-advocacy. We have every resource that your student will need to be successful here, but nobody's going to hold their hand, you know, and, and this is where students really need to lean in and be in that driver's seat. And that's why it's important to kind of use this application journey process as like that last like training wheels moment, because they're going to launch and they're going to be on their own. Um, we have truly every resource for those students to receive all the academic support that they need to be successful. 
but again, it goes into, do they raise their hand? Do they seek it out? Do they make sure that they're talking to their faculty, to staff members, going to our tutoring center to receive free tutoring? Are they going into office hours with their faculty? Um, I would go to Taco Tuesday with my faculty members sometimes to just make sure that I, I'm really up to speed on everything that I need to. Um, so being that self-advocate, it's not just a, an attribute that we like for no reason. Like we like it because that helps you be great and successful on our campus. Yeah. And to go a little further de into detail about the career counseling, um, each school and college actually has a career counselor um, that has, you know, information about those specific majors and programs that the students are going into. So that's one of the resources that Armin's talking about um, from a career standpoint. Yeah. And one of the unique things that we do is uh, your career services are yours for life for free. As a Chapman graduate, that is not a common thing across the board at most institutions. Um, and some students and parents, rightfully so, would push back and say, well, why do I need that for life if you do such a good job of helping me you know, launch from the get-go? Uh, so many people have job changes, career changes, uh, often and even early in their careers. And having support resources on our campus even if it's just like helping you navigate that difficult conversation of like asking for a promotion or a salary bump to your, you know, your bosses, like it's nice to have that support to come back and, and talk to our people on our campus to get that guidance. Going back to some of the social aspects, what is campus like on weekends? Do a lot of students go home? Uh, when I was a student, yeah. But not anymore, <laughs> and just to put it frankly. And if students are leaving our campus on weekends, they're going off campus together. Um, you know, they're they're exploring what Orange County and Southern California has to offer. They're they're going on road trips. They're going to the Coachella Valley for music festivals. They're going down to the beach. They're going camping. They're going to Big Bear Mountain and hitting the slopes. Um, they're doing the Chapman Challenge, which is absolutely chaos. But you go, you know skiing surfing and to disneyland all in the same day that is the chapman challenge um so students are, are always finding a lot of different things to do but it's not going home anymore um it is is certainly those that do go home like they're they're missing out on a lot of really fun social aspects of the institution that's definitely a piece of being a student at a university elsewhere and part of staying in the dorms and stuff is building up that like social culture and going home every weekend really prevents you from being able to do that. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about the vision and mission of Chapman and the overall climate and culture? Wow, that is a large question. <laughs> um, we have 13 minutes left of our time. I could spend all 13 minutes talking about that. Um, the mission of Chapman is to provide a personalized education of distinction that leads to students being ethical, inquiring global citizens. You know, we, we really want to underscore the personalized side of things, that ethical, that inquiring, and that global piece. Like we we promote that by having a very diverse set of students and faculty on our campus, by allowing students to, to pursue those global opportunities with study abroad options. Um, the personalized piece is very much a hallmark of who we've always been, even though we were, you know, I was, was 3,200 undergrads when I started here in 2002. We're now almost 8,000. What's maintained is that size in the classroom and, and really continuing to be a personalized institution. So I think our mission really speaks to that. Um, from a vision standpoint, there's there certainly is like a set, you know, here's our vision. But I think that what's important to know about Chapman is we have these five-year strategic plans that are always developed by our president, board of directors, and senior staff. And these five-year plans, these strategic plans help us stay really ahead of the curve in serving students um, and, and growing the institution and making sure that we're providing the best experience and then some, you know, a, a product that's only getting better as it goes and your degree gains value through our national rankings to go up, um, the endowment and, and what we're doing on that front and, and hopefully being able to provide more funding for students to be here and not have finances, finances be that hurdle. Um, you know, we we didn't have a school of engineering five years ago, six years ago. You know, we we now have a phenomenal school of engineering that is really almost a, one of those jewels in our crown. Um, we're opening up a brand new dance facility in like a month that is going to be incredible. Like we've always had this amazing dance program. 
but now we're going to have the facility that that matches the world class aspect of it. So we're always finding ways to improve. I think that we chose potential to look for in our students because we we want to have a growth mindset ourselves. Institutionally, Chapman's a place that has never arrived. We're always looking for ways to get better and whether it's a student experience or new facilities or amazing faculty and the research that they're doing. Um, for those that are interested in research, we are an R2 research institution within the Carnegie classification. That puts us in the top 10% of research institutions in the United States. You can do research day one here on our campus. Your students are going to have access to phenomenal facilities. We do almost $30 million in research annually. Um, and a lot of that's focused on the undergrad. So, you know, the the, the mission, the core values, the, the type of people that you're going to meet here, I, I hope it resonates with you. This is a place that if you lean in, you're going to get every dollar of that $82,000 a year out of it. Um, if you are offered, uh, if you're admitted and offered merit aid, is the aid only for freshman year or are you guaranteed that amount for the next three years as well? Merit-based aid is a, a fixed locked amount. So if you receive a $20,000 scholarship a year and you maintain your 2.75, 2 you'll have that $20,000 every year for four years. Need-based financial aid is subject to change every year because your financial situation is subject to change. Maybe one of you won that $1.6 billion jackpot on Powerball last night. If you did, your financial situation is far different than it was two days ago. Um, so every student that's curious and interested in need-based aid, you do submit a FAFSA every single year. Your family might experience job loss, um, you know, wage loss. There, there's there's other things that can come into play on an annual basis. So that need-based aid might change because your finances might change. One of the questions is about um, Chapman's internship program for students. Can you talk a little bit about that? I also know that we're um, uh, trying to launch a mentorship program. Um, that'll mm -hmm. be for alumni and that'll be like a more virtual thing as well. Um, alumni to student mentoring. Love it. Um, some of our programs require internships, like our, our communications degree, uh, school communications, like you have to have an internship in order to fulfill degree requirements. Uh, other programs, you know, are going to heavily encourage it, but not necessarily require it. It just depends on what you're studying. You know, if you're looking to go to graduate school and, and pursue an MD, like you're, you're not really going to be looking for internships. You're looking for more research opportunities. What's important to know here is that 97% of our students have either an internship or research experience or involved in, in serving the community in significant ways. So the vast majority of our students are really leaning in. School of Business and Economics and our Dodge College of Film and Media Arts, all of those students are doing probably multiple internships before they graduate. And to go back to what Nicole mentioned earlier, having a career planning and placement office within every single school and college gives you that chance to have niche-based placement. And then we have strategic partnerships that really allow students to get internships multiple times. The last piece is our location. You know, being where we are is really critical. You know, if we were in the middle of Nebraska and didn't have access to 85,000 businesses across all industries, that would change things quite a bit. You'll see a lot of our students are going to do internships during the year. They might have class Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and have an internship on Tuesday, Thursday that they're doing. This allows them to have four or five, six internships by the time they graduate, as opposed to just one or two that they're doing during, doing during the summers. So it's a very popular thing to do here. Um, you talked about this a little bit earlier with um, like the great acronym, but is GPA the most important part for accepting, um, for being accepted and to get a scholarship? Um, no, it's not. It, you know, we are holistic and context matters. You know, a 4.0 with little rigor is not very enticing to us, whereas a 3.5 with a ton of rigor might be. Um, so every bit of context really matters and, and what makes up that GPA. But what type of environment is this student in? And, and what are the obstacles that they're facing or what type of support do they have? You know, we, we really dive far deep beyond just a GPA. Do we need to make sure that students are strong academically to do well here? Absolutely. Do we seek that potential? And, and are we looking at trends? You know, do they start a little rocky and early on in freshman year? And have they started to improve or is there a decline? Like there's a lot of 
variables that go into our review process. Um, and not one of them anchors that final decision. All of them play into it. As far as scholarship goes, we do baseline off of academics, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily receive that. The quality of an overall application plays a massive role in the final decisions for both admission and scholarship for us. If you don't choose to major in film, can a student minor in film and take some film classes? We have a few minors that are within our Dodge College of Film and Media Arts. I, I certainly encourage you to look those up on our website. Um, you are not going to be minoring in film in a way where you're actually making film, if that makes sense. Um, you know, if you want to be a director, if you want to be involved in cinematography, editing, sound design, production design of an actual film, you really do need to be majoring in film and television production. Um, if you want to minor in film and media studies, that's awesome. That's great. You absolutely have access to apply to that minor and potentially get into that program. And that minor, that, that philosophy kind of carries into all of the minors that are in our talent areas is you do still have to apply to that and receive that approval from faculty um, to be pursuing those minors. So it's, it, it's important to know the nuance. If you have further questions on that, follow up with us and, and we'll certainly get into it. Um, there's one question about can parents, excuse me, <clears throat> can parents help volunteer in areas they specialize in to help support students in Chapman? Um, and yes, absolutely. We are always looking for parent volunteers, um, not just to like check in at events or anything like that, but actually provide some of their own real world experience. Um, so yes, our, the Office of Parent Engagement absolutely helps with that. Um, and that's your connection to be able to do something like that. Um, Aaron, can you share the view on SAT versus is ACT and if that makes a difference in admissions? For us, no longer. Uh, we are test optional and it's unshackled us from those um, really kind of ties to the old way of admission. I, it really, it, it's not present. It, test scores are very peripheral for us at this point, if not pretty much ignored, to be honest. And that's why we, we've talked a lot about that sappy Um whether it's SAT or ACT, it's not going to make a difference for us because we don't really care about them at, at large. You might be applying to other institutions or your students might be applying to institutions where, where test scores matter and that might play a role. Um, right now, and this is probably changing even this coming year, the only role that a test score has really played over the past three years is if a student wants to use test uh, scores for math placement purposes. That's really been the only thing. And we're now considering requiring all students to take a math placement exam anyway. So it, it might not even have um, holding water in that conversation anymore either. So for us, don't sweat SAT or ACT. If you have scores like our average SAT this past year, I think it was a 1340. Average ACT is about a 29. If you want to submit scores, that's great. That's fine. It's, it's really not going to impact or um, influence much of our decisions at this point. Uh, can you talk about um, mental health resources that are available for students? Yeah, so free free counseling services are certainly offered on our campus. Um, we do have a Healthy Panther initiative and orientation is going to help students really understand what types of resources do exist. Oftentimes, you'll see that we bring uh, puppies to campus during you know finals to, to just kind of have a little bit of that anxiety blown off. Um, we're going to program all the time. Your resident advisors within the dorms are going to be putting on programs and support services and, and really just like kind of out there making sure that you're doing well and that you're aware of the resources that exist to help you if you're not. So mental health is a huge piece. Um, it, it has become even bigger with the pandemic and, and students experiencing isolation and social anxiety and depression and stuff that we see a lot. And we are really happy that students are, are talking about it because it gives us a chance to provide the support that they need when they do talk about it. So um, you'll see that Chapman's very well aware of, of this being a thing and, and not going away and that we're going to invest in our community, making sure that the resources are there to help them. Um, one of the questions is about Chapman being a D3 school. Will they ever change to becoming a D2? Um, I know I played lacrosse at Chapman when I was a student, and I know that historically they were a D2, and they actually made the decision to become a D3 school. Um, so I don't think that they're ever going to go back to a D2. 
Definitely not. Um, and, and that, you know, we, we took all the funding that was put towards athletics. This was in the early nineties when we switched and we put that all into merit scholarship to attract better students, as opposed to being focused on the athletic standpoint. It doesn't mean that there aren't competitive programs here. We have many athletic teams on our campus that would mop the floor with D2 schools, <laughs> like just to be perfectly honest. And, and it's not necessarily about how good or competitive. It's just, we don't have athletic scholarship. That's the big designating difference between the two. All right. I think we've answered most of the questions that have been pulled up. Yeah, this has been phenomenal. And I, I want to give a quick shout out to our colleagues that have been in the Q&A this morning. You all have been phenomenal. There's over 200 questions that have been answered within the chat itself. And there's 82 that are still open. Um, so what I will say is that oftentimes what we do is we pull these Q&As and we see if there are any questions that were unanswered. Uh, if there's really important stuff, we might reach out to you and try and help you with that. But I do encourage you instead to reach out to us directly. So if there was something that was not answered here today, go onto our website, as we talked about earlier, find who your admission counselor is and engage with us and really have your student engage with us. Um, we can get you lined up to talk to other current students that are perhaps from where you are from or that are studying what you are wanting to study. Um, I think we have over 60 or 70 students that, that are on a, a chat offering that we have that you can just jump in and, and talk to them about what's going on. So we, um, we have a lot going on there. We also have um, something that we really encourage you to lean into is our all of the Discover Chapman virtual events that we are hosting. We have tons of opportunities for you to learn directly from academic departments, to learn from um, student services, to hear from the dean's office, to jump into athletic um, conversations, you know, learn about residence life and financial aid. Our Discover Chapman events are phenomenal. So keep your eyes on your emails, go to our websites, look at the different things that exist, and, and we'll certainly um, look forward to engaging with you. And, and really, again, thank you for spending some of your Sunday morning, afternoon, or evening with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it was great chat with you, Nicole. I hope you all have a <laughs> wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll look forward to talking to you all soon. Thanks.